Okay, your move. Oh, hi there. We've finally got some sunshine after this uh, pretty dull week, so I thought I'd sit out the back and play the banjo. Um, I hope you are also enjoying something, some rest on this time. We've got a great service for you today. We're starting off with Barry White, who's going to bring us around the communion table. So if you haven't prepared some bread and some juice or some wine, uh, then maybe pause the video and get that ready now. Um, and leading into that, we're going to play a hymn that Barry refers to during his communion talk. And a slightly different version of the hymn. It's a Christian high school from Canada who are must have been doing a tour in Hawaii or something they've recorded there, but they're just doing a beautiful version uh, of a lovely old hymn. Also got a couple of videos uh, today. We've got uh, one that refers to Triple C VAT's Emerging Leaders Program for next year. And so a little bit of uh, uh, information about that and there's a link at the end of it. If you are curious and want to know more about it, you can go on to that link and uh, follow that up for yourself. Also, Peter Nathan is just going to share a small video, a short video with some news from the eldership. Also, if you're not getting our uh, Edge newsletters on a Friday, then um, you can subscribe just by writing to Dalreen at office at edgechurch.org.au and making sure you're on the list. So make sure you're on the list to get our, uh, our newsletters because there's a lot more information on there. And as we begin to open up, uh, whatever that might be, um, the sort of protocols that we have to go through, the practices that we have to go through, uh, will be detailed in that for your information. Uh, also, if you are giving online or you'd like to give online, then here are the details on the screen. Uh, you can just pause the video and just make a note of those details. It's very easy, uh, very easy to do to help support the church during this time. That would be wonderful. Uh, the sermon is Today is a, uh, from Luke chapter 16, so if you want to have your Bibles ready and your fing finger in, the, the, uh, in that chapter, uh, Luke chapter 16, and Steph Spanos is from the Young Adults is going to be uh, reading that for us, and then I'll be preaching on planning your future, and um, we'll be looking at some is issues in that particular section. Following the sermon, there is a, a song that we've been wanting to learn in the music team this year, but we haven't had the chance. But it's got movements, and so I encourage you to get up off your couches. Um, it's only three minutes. Get up out of your bed and practice these movements so when we learn this song, we can get the whole church moving, get a bit of blood flowing, get the exercise going. Following that, we've got Edge Got Talent. And this week, we've got a very special vid video from Jem Price of a skill that he's obviously been developing during this lockdown time. Uh, if you've got a skill or something that you've been doing, and get in touch with us and we'll show you how to upload the video and uh, we can include that as part of Edge's Got Talent. But make sure you watch right to the end of today's service because Jem's got an amazing skill he wants to show us. So I trust you enjoy today's service. I trust you are keeping well and I pray God's blessing over you all. God bless you. Have you had your move yet?
Well, good morning, church. Um, this is another opportunity for us to remember the Lord, and it's my privilege this morning to share with, uh, a thought for communion. And uh, But before I do, I, I just want to thank Glenn and all those that have contributed of uh, ministering to us through this medium. 
we know it's not the best thing, but it's probably the second best. So I've appreciated very much everyone's contribution. And we thank you for Glenn's ministry. This morning, I want to talk about an aspect of, of worship. There's a number of things we could do to, as we lead into this time of communion. But I want to share an experience that I had some years ago. Uh, I was a chaplain in a hospital and there was a patient there who was elderly and I didn't know her name. But as I walked past, she tried to say something and I couldn't understand a word that she was saying. And a nurse came to me and she said, Barry, I heard her singing yesterday and I think she was singing a hymn. So I went over and I held her hand and I started singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And as I sang, she sang. And the amazing thing was that I could understand every word that she sang. And then we sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. And again, I could understand every word. So in her life, these words were a part of her life. And I believe that she was a Christian. But the thing that I found is that in my own experience, that I found the giftedness of other people's writings have been helpful and instrumental in uh, me uh, understanding more about what God has done for us through Christ Jesus. With this COVID-19, one of the things I've noticed is that you're not allowed to sing in public. And singing is, is a part of our worship. But I've found that over the years, there's been a number of songwriters or hymn writers that have made the communion so special by their writings. So I want to share some of those uh, hymns. Some are old, some are very old. Uh, some are quite new. And let me share just some of those. There's the hymn that says, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. But in one of the verses it says, See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingle down. Did he such love or sorrow meet? or thorns compose so rich a crown. Another hymn says, or psalm says, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. One of my favourites is, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a lost world were slain. This is the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross. This the power of the cross, Son of God, slain for us. What a love, what a cost. We stand forgiven at the cross. There's a chorus we used to sing. Wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions and now I am free. Why? All because Jesus, not only was he wounded for me, but he died for me. 
And so these hymn writers have been able to to paint the picture of, of what Jesus did for us at the cross. And this morning, we have another opportunity of taking the emblems which Jesus has asked us to remember him by. And we do that this morning in gratitude and thankfulness and appreciation. Let me give thanks for these emblems before we participate of them. Let us bow. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the inspiration that you have given to people to communicate what you did for us on the cross of Calvary. Father, we know that you had a plan for mankind to bring us to yourself, and that plan meant that your son would have to die for us. And we thank you this morning that we can celebrate that he has done that. He died, he rose again, he conquered sin, he conquered death. And so, Father, we thank you that this morning, in obedience to what he has asked us to do, we remember him. We remember him as we take the bread when he asked his disciples to do this in remembrance of him and also the cup and by saying this is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Again, we do this in remembrance of him. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we take the bread, which speaks of his body, which bore our sin. Now we take the cup, which speaks to us of his precious blood poured out on our behalf. We look forward to doing this collectively in the future. God bless. Hi. I'm here now to announce the fact that uh, Mike Walsh has decided to retire from eldership at Edge Church after um, about 20 years in the role, including a couple of years of sabbatical in that period. So Mike has, uh, has made an enormous contribution to our church in this role over the last 20 years and has been a wonderful example to all of us and very much a role model for me at a personal level. As we know, Mike does have a real heart for people. He has, has, a, has a pastoral heart, he has a shepherd's heart, uh, but he also has um, an eye for detail and has, has a, a real preparedness to to work tirelessly behind the scenes in um, to perform many tasks, which he always does without any fanfare, without any fuss, but always effectively and importantly, always unto the Lord. We'd also like to uh, thank um, Mike's wife, Cynthia. And Cynthia's been a great, clearly a great support and encouragement and sounding board to Mike um, during this time, and particularly during some of the more stressful moments, which inevitably um, are associated with with this role, so thank you, Mike, on behalf of the uh, very much on behalf of the elders, very much on behalf of the of the church. We'll miss you in that role, but we certainly will not miss you as you continue to be an integral part of our church uh, moving forward. As will Cynthia. So now let's just uh, thank Mike and pray for his uh, next phase of his life. Thank you. Dear Lord, we thank you very much for, for Mike. We thank you for his service, Lord, for you, his heart for you. Uh, we, we really appreciate that, Lord, and we know that he has a heart for building your kingdom, and we know, Lord, that he has done so in a way which is very much under the Lord. We also thank you, Lord, for Cynthia and the work that she has done and the, and the great support she has been to Mike. We pray, them now, pray for them now, Lord, in the next phase of their life, um, and we pray for your leading, your guiding, your protection, and we ask that uh, you may bless them in this next phase. So we 
pray all this in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Hi, my name's Andy Hodgson and I want to take this next minute to chat to you a little bit about the Emerging Leaders Program and why you should consider it for yourself, for the leaders you're developing or as a partnership for your church or ministry organisation. You know, before sending out the 12, Jesus says, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. We still believe this to be the case today, and that's why we want to equip and train disciple-making and movement-building leaders to be sent, so that we may see disciple-making movements launched in all church and community contexts across Australia. The Emerging Leaders Program is an opportunity for leaders to establish their leadership now and to impact their future ministry. Our heart is to equip, train and launch generations of leaders who think movements like Jesus did, who live authentically as disciple makers in their everyday life and who are known to be kingdom minded. We explore the life of Jesus as our model of leadership and lifestyle. By journeying through Jesus' life chronologically, we discover his priorities, his methods, his mission, and his model. And then we work hard to help to implement these priorities in your personal lives and ministries that you lead through coaching, mentoring, and practical application. In addition to this, we recognize the importance of accredited biblical and theological studies. So through our partnership with ACOM, students engage in academic study anywhere from a higher ed diploma through to a master's. We also further explore specific leadership skills for today and we do this all as a learning cohort. And so we would like you to consider being a part of any of our programs so that you can be equipped, trained and launched so together we can see disciple making movements through your life and leadership. Luke chapter 16 verses 1 to 9. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Great to be with you. Here I am back in the auditorium, completely empty as normal, but looking good just the same. A sense of expectation that one day we'll be allowed back in here, hopefully this year. First of all, I also want to apologise for looking a little uglier than normal. Uh, I had the opportunity last week with a week off from preaching to have a little skin cancer removed and stitches were taken out Thursday and that's all still healing. And apparently... Uh, I spent too much time in the sun when I was younger and getting burnt regularly and I really wasn't thinking about what could happen in 40 or 50 years later. So just a warning to you young people, be careful what you do when you're out there this summer. You don't know what consequences it's going to have later. Uh, and that leads me to today's message entitled Planning Your Future because for a lot of us, we, uh, we don't think about that too much. And I'm going to continue on from Luke chapter 15, where we had the story of the prodigal, to Luke chapter 16, which is actually a continuation of the same speech. Because normally we often get to the chapter headings and we stop. 
uh, and we don't read, uh, but I encourage you not to read the headings. They're actually not part of God's word. We've added those. And in Luke chapter 15, verse 1, it tells us that Jesus is addressing a crowd of tax collectors and sinners who drew near to him to hear him. And in Luke 15, verse 2, it says that the scribes and the Pharisees were also there uh, as well. And they began to complain, of course, as is their want. So through chapter 15, Jesus is speaking to the tax collectors and sinners because they were the lost ones. And so his speech in chapter 15 deals with the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And in chapter 16, he turns to his disciples in verse 1 and begins to tell them a story, knowing that the Pharisees and the scribes who were still there were also listening. It says in, in verse 14 of chapter 16, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things and they derided him. And then Jesus goes on and uh, responds to them directly with a rebuke. And the story that Jesus told that we're going to have a look at today and that Steph read to us earlier is commonly known as the parable of the unjust servant or in some of your Bibles it may say the unjust steward. So let's put this story as we've heard it this morning, let's put it into modern terms. A manager is employed to run a business for the owner. And then the owner hears a rumour that the manager is wasting his goods. Well, the owner confronts him and questions him. He's not immediately fired on the spot. Maybe the owner is still investigating. Whatever it was, it must have been true because the manager's reaction, he knows he's in trouble. He knows he's going to be fired. He knows he's going to struggle to find another job. And he says, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't dig uh, and I'm too ashamed to beg. So he comes up with a scheme and he goes to those other business owners who owe his owner, his employer, money. And he ingratiates himself with them by doing a favour, hoping that they'll give him a job when he loses his present one. So he goes to them and says, well, if you owe him 100 measures of oil, now give him 50. Do it straight away. If you owe 100 measures of wheat, now give him 80. Do it right now. And so now, the way I read the story, the owner has actually lost more money because of this manager. He's owed an extra 50 measures of oil and another 20 measures of wheat that he could have had. So just imagine if you were an employer and your employee did this. You're about to fire him. You're not going to give him a reference. And then he goes out and he rips you off again. But in Jesus' story, the owner commends the manager and said, hey, that was pretty shrewd. That was pretty clever. That was smart work. Now, we don't know what happened. He probably still got the sack. But I just want to ask, what's going on? Because to this point, it looks like Jesus is commending dishonesty. It seems like it's okay to rip someone off if it's in order to secure your own future. It seems that it's uh, the smartest and wisest thing to do is to look after number one. And the manager, instead of being punished for the crime, it seems he'll be com commended for using his nous, using his smarts. And even though God's word in the Old Testament always condemns theft and stealing, it does allow for mitigating circumstances. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30 and 31 says, They do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. Yet when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all the substance of his house. So I ask, is this what Jesus is talking about here? Is he saying it's okay to be dishonest if you're in need? Because that would justify a lot of dishonesty when that we feel that, feel that we're owed that little bit extra, that we're entitled to it. We, oh, we've done extra hours this week and my boss doesn't pay me correctly anyway, so it's okay for me to take these paper clips or, or what have you. you know, we would be justified because it's part of our need. 
Well, just let me say quite clearly that it is not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying it's always wrong to steal and it all, stealing always demands justice and restitution of some sort. The manager here is not being commended for his dishonesty. Rather, he is a dishonest manager who is being commended for his wisdom in securing his own future, his cunning, his shrewdness, his wisdom, his prudence. In fact, the dishonest manager may have prevented the owner from being dishonest himself. There was a law in the Old Testament that Jews were, Jewish businessmen were not to charge fellow Jews usury or interest. So if you went to uh, borrow money from them, they could not charge you interest on that money. But the Jews were always looking at loopholes and trying to get uh, through, uh, get ways past these little laws. And so what they would do is when they were trading, they would trade commodities rather than cash. So if you went to someone and they said, yes, I'll lend you 50 measures of oil. And I'll give it to you now, but you need to give me back 100 when you can. Or yes, you can have 80 measures of wheat, as in our story, if you give me back 100 measures in return. So when the manager wrote off the debt, there is one view that he was writing off the interest only. He was keeping the owner honest. So the owner couldn't really get angry with him because he was also being dishonest. Uh, I can imagine the owner coming to him and saying, OK, I see what you've done there. Very clever. But you're still fired. And if they want to give you a job, well, go and work for them. The point that Jesus is making is that even though the manager failed in his stewardship, he had enough common sense and foresight to prepare for a new future in the employ of another, in a, in a different household. Jesus goes on to say, as he expounds his own story, to say that the world is wiser in this skill than the sons of light. That's us. Since the world is wiser in preparing for the future than we are. And thinking about this, I have to agree. Because when I was younger, I never worried about the future. I lived in the present and, and I just lived for each day. I didn't care what was going to happen tomorrow. I expected the present to go on forever. And even when I became a Christian at age 24, I suddenly, as a son of the light, if you like, I got lazy and I left it all up to God. Oh, well, it'll be all right. God will take care of everything. OK, if I need a provision, God will take care of that. And, uh, and I, I had a real Aussie, she'll be right, mate, attitude to planning for my future. But there's a good warning in this story that we need to pay heed to. There are times when everything may not always be all right, mate. Life has a strange way of interrupting our comfortable existence. For the manager in the story, suddenly his dishonesty or his neglect, his wasting of the goods was found out and suddenly his job was on the line. You know, that, that's quite a dilemma. It could be similar for us. You may have lost a job and now unemployed during 2020. Maybe like the steward, you're looking at your other skill set and you're going, well, I can't dig. I can't work on the roads and I'm too ashamed to beg and I can't busk on street corners. I don't have any other skills. Maybe it's a relationship breakdown that changes your future or a loss of a loved one or a health crisis. Maybe even a pandemic that interrupts our lives. Many such interruptions are unavoidable. And they're often wake up calls to assess our future. It doesn't always have to be negative things. Just getting married can suddenly make you uh, reassess your future and your plans. Having a, uh, the first child, the second child, uh, the tenth child, you know, all of these things can disrupt that little bit of comfort we have and make us assess our plans for the future and how we are, what we are looking for uh, in the future. The point that Jesus is making is simply that if worldly people are wise enough to plan their futures, how much more should the children of light be planning and preparing for theirs?
because our future is totally different. Our, our future is eternal. Our future is in a different household. It's in God's household. And uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 9, the last verse that Steph read to us, he says, I say to you, and this is the moral of the story, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. That's money. Uh, unrighteous mammon, that's filthy lucre. It's called in, in other versions. Uh, and these day and age, we know what dirty money is. Shops won't take cash anymore because it's considered it could be contaminated. That dirty money. And he says, when, for, uh, make friends for yourselves by this dirty money that when you fail, and there is an expectation we will fail, whether it's in the natural or whether it's at our end of life. What he's saying here is when, you, when your body fails and you, you die, that they may receive you, those friends may receive you into an everlasting home. What a wonderful promise this could be. We're promised an everlasting home. So with this statement, Jesus introduces into his story this idea of dirty money. And he, but he goes on also to encourage us and encourage faithfulness in the way we use money. To whom a little is given, use it wisely and you can be entrusted with more and things like that. And there's also a warning there about falling into the trap of trying to serve two masters. And he comes out explicitly and says, you cannot serve God and mammon. At this stage, he's talking to the Pharisees who the, that, that verse 14 tells us were lovers of money. Now in directing his story now, to the disciples, but then turning it round because he knows the Pharisees are listening. Jesus has two purposes. The first is really to get under the Pharisees' skin. He loves exposing these religious hypocrites uh, and he loves exposing them for what it was. And today it was that they were lovers of money. But more than that, they were actually guilty of trying to serve two masters, God and money. And like the steward in the story, like the, the employee in the story, they had wasted what the owner, who is God, had given them. They were wasting the revelation had, that God had given to them. The scriptures were being neglected. The doctrines were being neglected. Uh, the law was being neglected. And people were, they were trying to work out loopholes and ways around this commandment and ways around this law. And because they hadn't been faithful in that, God is saying he was not going to entrust them with anything more. We can see how chapter 16 is connected to chapter 15 now in this address. Jesus is directly addressing both his audiences. And this one is a real rebuke. The second purpose that Jesus has in telling this story is to encourage those who have a little to be faithful with it, for more will be entrusted to them. More will be given. And the context of that statement is still this idea of the unrighteous mammon or the money. God is, okay. God is saying, look, it's okay to have money. It's okay whether you've got a little, use it wisely. And it's okay to be rich if you've got a lot of money, use it wisely. Use it to make friends in heaven. Or in another place in the scripture it says, Use it to lay up treasures for yourself in heaven where gold and silver do not rust and tarnish. Uh, Jesus is saying, use the unrighteous mammon. Use the dirty money, but use it wisely. But do not become a slave to it. Do not serve it. You know, in other words, lay down your life for God, but don't lay down your life for money. So while the emphasis in this section is on money, it's about a lot more than that. For the Pharisees, yes, it was about money, but it was also about their handling of their beliefs. It was about their handling of scripture. It was about the way that they were keeping the commandments and compromising them in the way that they found loopholes and did things like that. 
And so for us, it is also much more than just about finances. Yeah, finances are important. Finances reveal what's in our heart. Finances reveal our attitude to God and to his commandments and, and helping the poor and doing charitable good works and, and tithes and offerings are all important aspects of the way we conduct ourselves before God. But God has given us so much more than just that. And the question is, are we like the good steward, uh, sorry, the the a wicked steward in this story, wasting what we have or using it wisely to plan for our eternal future. God has given us all different skills and talents. Can we use them to glorify God and help others? God may have placed you in a position or a role where you can help others and that's wise to do. Are you doing it? It may just be in family. God may have given you a family and children and there is wisdom in giving them the time, the energy and the love necessary to reveal God to that next generation. That's an investment. That's a positive investment that we can make just by time and love in our families. Maybe God has blessed you with numerous or various resources that can be used for good. Or maybe he has entrusted you with that unrighteous mammon and wants you to use it wisely. While this story is specifically directed at those who are wasting God's goods, it's also a great source of encouragement to, a, who, to those who are using those goods wisely. It promises us a safe and everlasting home with friends there to greet us. What a future we have before us. So let's plan for those futures wisely and conduct ourselves accordingly so that our future aligns with the future God has for his children. That our future will be in that everlasting home that we've been promised. My warning to those who haven't possibly thought about their future home is start making those investments now. If you want to buy a home in the future, say young people, you're thinking you want to buy a home, start saving for it now. You're not going to turn 30, get married and suddenly go, oh, now I'm going to buy a house. You need your deposit. You need some money in the bank. You need a credit rating. You need to have some of this stuff thought about a lot earlier than when you suddenly need that house for your family. And it's the same with our faith. Start small, start now, start investing into heaven and planning for your eternal future as you spend time there with God. You don't know how long you've got. The Bible consistently talks about our days being like shadows. We're, we're, we're born and we live and we die and it's so fast and so quick that it happens before we've even realised it and we've come to the end. And it can happen very suddenly. So but. Plan now, take time now to begin investing in your heavenly future. I'm just going to close in prayer. Next week, we're going to continue with this story because Jesus, as well as teaching the Pharisees about the, the use of their money at this stage and rebuking them for that, he still has more to say uh, uh, on that particular issue and also talking about what they can expect beyond death. And so we'll be looking at the last part of this chapter 16 next week as well. Let me pray. Father God, I pray that uh, I thank you for the great promise that of an everlasting future, an everlasting home we have with friends there to greet us and uh, welcome us in. And I pray, Lord, for those who may have been wasteful with what you've given them, like this unjust servant, like this uh, uh, manager who's neglected what he's had and wasted his owner's goods. I pray, Lord, that we will just reflect on that in the days to come and that, that which we have been given, we will begin to invest wisely that we may obtain that new heavenly home, that security of knowing that we have a future firmly entrenched with you. Lord, let us not be found wanting at the end of our life because we've been neglectful at the beginning. 
So I thank you, Lord, and pray for our congregation. Pray for all the hearers who are hearing this, that they will indeed consider this strange little story that Jesus tells and the implications it has for us in our day. So I thank you, Father God, and I pray for everybody's well-being in Jesus' name. Thank you very much, everyone. God bless you. Whips. <laughs>